discuss uh, her areas of ex expertise, which are neuroendocrine tumors in children and young adults. Thank you very much. Two, car two uh, physicians who take care of pediatrician uh, kids in a row, so that's uh, uh, a good omen for uh, those of you who are, are have nets and uh, that will diagnose a little earlier and uh, give you a longer life. So I want to um, uh, talk about several things with you. My goals for you in the audience are that by the time I finish, you'll be able to compare the incidence and prevalence of NETS with another pediatric tumor, neuroblastoma, in people who are under the age of 30. Now, we've heard incidence and prevalence several times this morning, and I, it's hard for me to keep them straight, so I'm going to go through that with you a little. I want you to recognize, uh, and actually sort of preaching to ourselves as physicians, that we should be able to recognize the diagnostic dilemmas in kids that may account for delays in diagnosis. Then I want to evaluate um, a couple of diagnostic algorithms that might help us as pediatricians to be able to recognize kids earlier. And finally, I want to uh, walk through with you how we've used the biology of these tumors in uh, treating some kids with NETS. Okay, which I'm going to use the SEER data. You've heard that term also this morning. It's the way in the United States that tumors are kept track of. And uh, this is the SEER database. I'm going to talk about what's been diagnosed in, in young people under the age of 30 from 1973 to 2004. The ones that are included in the way I looked at this, this SEER database are medullary thyroid carcinoma, MENs, which are going to be talked about this afternoon, pheochromocytoma, which actually is not from the endocrine system, it's from the neural crest. But as uh, Dr. Warner talked this morning, it's pretty hard to differentiate those two. And maybe the neuroendocrine system actually starts out embryologically when we're in the womb uh, from the neural crest. Uh, then there are adrenal tumors other than neuroblastoma, because I'm going to uh, talk about neuroblastoma separately. And then finally, carcinoid, the most common one in all of the tumors that I studied in this database. Now, where is the location of these nets in kids? That's in people who are under the age of 30. So I'm just going to go right down here to the table. And Dr. Oberg and Dr. Walterine and Dr. Granberg, will you each tell me where do you think is the most common place for a net in someone under 30? It, okay, sympathetic nerve. Same. Anybody else? Okay. So, here's the real data. Looky there. Does my pointer work? There it is. The lung. I, I was astonished when I saw that. Where's the second one? Gonadal. Now, we, I heard Dr. Waltering and Dr. Warner this morning talk about ovarian and breast. And if you put those together, just think about this. In young people under the age of 30, the lung and the breast and ovary are the most common. Now, I look at this and I say, is this the reason that overall nets are more common in women than in men? And we have been missing all of these times how common the lung and the uh, gonadal tumors are in young people. And is this one place that we could make a huge difference in diagnosing earlier and following those people more closely uh, through their lifetimes. Dr. Diaz talked about he's following kids who had cardiac disease as babies. And we need to be thinking about the same thing in terms of following young people who have nets. Okay. 
That does not include neuroblastoma. And, and we're coming up to neuroblastoma. Uh, incidence, what is the incidence? According to the way I'm looking at this data, incidence is, I'm going to talk about the year 2004. How many people, I'm going to compare how many kids under the age of 30 had neuroblastoma diagnosed in 2004, and how many young people that same age group had neuroendocrine tumor diagnosed. Okay, the red is the neuroblastoma. And you can see right off the bat that neuroblastoma for kids under the age of one is, is the highest of all of these in this age group. And you don't start to see neuroendocrine tumors until you get out here to about 10, although I'm going to show you uh, pictures on a young lady who was six years old and had a metastatic tumor by the time she came to me at six. And we start to see the neuroendocrine tumors then increase in incidence. That's the number of new ones diagnosed in the year 2004 by the time we get up here to age 30. Now, it doesn't compare to the number that you see in, um, in adults. So here's the 60 to 65 year old group, and the diagnosis is really almost 10 times what you're seeing even in the highest group in 30. But remember, I don't want kids to live, we, we talked this morning about a 15 year, and I'm gonna talk about a 15 year survival after your net is diagnosed, my six-year-old would only be 21 if that's all we considered. And so we want to talk about long-term survival. And I think the problem here is the instance, yes, is much greater for neuroblastoma. And even as pediatric oncologists, we don't even consider neuroendocrine tumors because the incidence of neuroblastoma is higher. Okay, now let's talk about prevalence. So let's go back to the year 2004. And I want to talk about how many patients were there out there who needed to be treated or cared for who had neuroblastoma, and how many were there who needed to be cared for who had a neuroendocrine tumor. And the story is exactly reversed and actually much more dramatic than we had expected. Look at the yellow bar. And this is incidence, the number newly diagnosed in 2004. Yes, there were, as we'd seen before, more kids in the yellow who had neuroblastoma than who had, in the blue and the red together, neuroendocrine tumors. But let's look at how many kids overall in this age group really needed to be taken care of. And you see it's almost... 10 times uh, more who need cared for with neuroendocrine tumors, and we're not doing a very good job of that, I think. Okay, so why aren't we able to diagnose them? And uh, this is more aimed at us as pediatricians, uh, actually, but I think uh, if you know uh, families who have a child with these symptoms, you can be of help. Uh, to those families. Well, we talked, Dr. Gramber just talked about lung carcinoid, and I'm telling you that lung carcinoid is the most common neuroendocrine tumor in children and young adults. Well, what kid do you know who doesn't have cough? And what kid or young person do you know, you know, how many times do they get pneumonia? We talk about it as walking pneumonia, and we don't even put them in the hospital anymore. So it's very easy to forget that we need to look farther. And I want to show you how we need to follow those who, who should be followed. Okay, what's the next most common? Uh, in the abdomen, ovarian and uh, intestinal. Well, what kid doesn't have a bellyache? So again, following a child and making that diagnosis uh, takes a little extra thinking on the part of us as, as pediatricians. And then finally, okay, I can order 
promogranin A. I can order gastrin or substance B. But if I order this on a seven-year-old, what's the normal value? And we don't have those values yet. So uh, there are some real problems, I think, in diagnosing these tumors in, in kids and young people. And here's, uh, and then we talk about survival. And um, uh, Dr. Olberg talked in his opening statement about survival. I think, you know, if we say right now the financial uh, world is suffering very much from our backwardness in the United States, well, unfortunately, here's another area, uh, and that's in neuroendocrine tumors. The survival of kids in 1984 uh, with nets was great compared to neuroblastoma. You can see out here, and I'm, here's where I'm talking about a 15-year survival for a person who has a net. It's about 78% is what it came out to be. And look at here at neuroblastoma. It's only 40%. Let's move ahead to 2004. Woo, look what happened to neuroblastoma. We put our minds to it. And we worked on neuroblastoma, and we're now curing almost 70% of kids with neuroblastoma. What have we done with NETS? It's actually fallen a little bit. Not a lot, from 78% to 72%, but we're not moving forward. And I think that's a real problem. 20 years later, kids with neuroblastoma have a much better prognosis, and kids with NETS uh, are the same, or maybe even a little less. So what are the treatment dilemmas for kids? Well, first of all, as Dr. Warner said, you don't suspect it, you can't detect it, and I think that's a lot of our problem in pediatrics. What do we do when we have an unknown primary? Well, we probably don't, even, we probably don't do anything for a young person. We just say, you got pneumonia, maybe you got it again, you got a belly ache. Suck it up, get rid of it, you know, get over it. Uh, we don't know how to take care of non-functional tumors. Uh, with appendix, which we, uh, until I did this uh, research, uh, thought was the most common carcinoid in young people under the age of 30, and it is the third most common cause. We take it out, we say forget about it, and those kids never get followed up. Uh, Chemotherapy is for slow-growing tumors, and we don't. Uh, so what do we do with, with children and young people who have neuro neuroendocrine tumors? Uh, what do you do with a child who has metastatic liver disease? And from that, what follows is, do we give liver transplants and lung transplants to young people who've had metastatic disease to, to the liver uh, and actually give them more than 15 years of life to live. So I'm going to show you it, uh, with a child, and this is actually built around a child who uh, came to us in, in Iowa, uh, had pneumonia, was treated with uh, antibiotics, but the culture was negative. But we gave, we always give antibiotics for pneumonia, so we gave antibiotics. If you do culture something and you give the right antibiotic and a child ha who has pneumonia, that's great. Most of the time you can really forget about that. So what about the child who comes back and has a culture negative? That child may never have another tumor, may never have another recurrence of that pneumonia, they still need to be watched closely. They may have an immune deficiency, uh, most likely, if they continually have uh, viral pneumonias, which is possible. So what do you think about when they, when they do have a pneumonia? Here we are at a recurrence, and, and then how do we think about this? That's the time I think we as pediatricians need to start thinking, and maybe Dr. Granberg can, can uh, help us a little on this. 
But the, the child that I most recently think about is a child who's exactly in this condition, had three recurrent pneumonias, never was culture positive, and finally, at this point, a CT scan was done, and they found the lesion. The problem is, on the CT scan, uh, if you don't find a lesion, then you still need to watch that child closely. If you do have a lesion, then what I want the surgeons to think about is we need an Arcturia scan. We need peptides before they go to get the biopsy. And what happened was we, we actually encouraged this surgeon to do the Arcturia scan. And they said no. And actually our radiologists encouraged them to do it, to get an Arcturia scan. And they said, no, this is just a pneumonia. It's probably crypt cryptococcus or it's, you know, it's a little fungus. It's October in Iowa and, and there's all kinds of molds out there. But it turned out to be actually a neuroendocrine tumor. So let's go, we can go through this uh, algorithm a little faster. What if you have a kid who has a bellyache? Okay, so they have a bellyache, and most of the time kids who have bellyaches have constipation. So, of course, that's where you start. And if they have diarrhea, most of the time when they have diarrhea, it's a viral infection. So, you know, it, it, makes, much, it, it makes sense to think about the more common things at that point and to treat them with laxatives or just to give them fluids and let them get over the viral enteritis. Now, what if uh, you actually uh, are a good diagnostic GI person and you say, okay, I think this is an ulcer. Well, you treat for an ulcer. And again, this is becoming more common in, in, in children and we know the most common cause in kids is H. pylori. Probably every one of us here in the room has had H. pylori at one time and it's moving down faster and faster into uh, this age group. But again, what do you do when you have a recurrence? This is the time, not up here when you see, first see somebody who has abdominal pain, but when they recur, we got to think about a net. And then we do the scope and the biopsy now, and probably they still have an ulcer. But it makes sense at that point to, to catch some peptides and see whether those peptides are negative or positive. If they're negative, treat them again for an ulcer disease. If those peptides are positive, or if the biopsy actually shows some kind of a positive lesion, all of these kids should go down the same pathway and at that point have an arcturia scan. And still you're going to find probably half of these don't have, or maybe even 80% of them are going to be negative for any kind of a neuroendocrine tumor. But we've got to think that way to be able to diagnose them. Well, we've had the opportunity at Iowa to, do, to use some therapy. Dr. Granberg talked to you a little bit about, uh, about using peptide radiotherapy. And again, unfortunately, this is a place where we're behind in the United States. Uh, but we have had the opportunity at Iowa to uh, do a phase one trial on young people who have somatostatin receptor positive tumors. So in a phase one, these were kids, who, kids under the age of 25 now who had to have failed at least two other therapies. And... Uh, our objectives were to see whether it was safe or not to use in kids. If it was safe, we wanted to determine what dose we could use to do a larger study. And finally, we wanted if we, uh, to see, well, did any of these children have any kind of response at all? Again, I'll just point out to you on, on who could be in this trial, uh, they had to have an Arcturia scan positive tumor and they had to have failed uh, prior therapy. 
Uh, I, actually, the FDA required me to do a bone marrow on all of these kids and make sure they're either they had good bone marrow status or they had bone marrow uh, stem cells stored. So actually, on probably about half of the kids that we treated, we had to, uh, to uh, harvest bone marrow stem cells for them before we were allowed to do it. So we, uh, here's the Octrea scan, which you're all familiar with. And this is the little six-year-old that I, that I was telling you about. Uh, you can see on CT scan, it was actually missed the first time on, uh, on CT scan, but the Octrea scan clearly showed a lesion in the pancreas, as well as several liver metastases. This is, again, at six years old. And uh, you can see Dr. Tom Odo uh, stole my slide, yes. This beautiful slide that we have of somatostatin receptor staining uh, is this child with the um, uh, liver, that's from the liver metastasis. So the, the treatment plan was that they would get six weeks apart. They, they got three treatments with uh, yttrium-90 labeled Dodotoc and uh, had a bone marrow at the end. And I'm happy to say I can tell you right now that nobody had any uh, decrease in the cellularity of their bone marrow after their, after their treatment. So the FDA was happy to hear that too. Okay, who was in this trial? Well, I actually, I have to tell you that I'm really a pediatric oncologist, and I uh, set the trial up for kids who had medulloblastoma and kids who had neuroblastoma. I didn't even consider neuroendocrine tumors. But who came to see us in Iowa? It was these young people who didn't have any opportunity for any other therapy. So, yes, we did have four children with brain tumors, Four gastronomas in kids under the age of 25. Three neuroblastomas. So I did get a few of the kids that I originally planned to treat. Uh, three young people with uh, metastatic pheo. Two bronchial carcinoids. One insulinoma. And one MEN2B. So what's the response? Well, I think this is the best news. 44% of these kids had a positive response. That's greater than 50% decrease in their tumor size. Another 17% had a, what I call a minimal response, greater than 25% decrease in their tumor burden, but less than 50%. And another 17 had, had uh, stable disease for at least six months. Now, two out of the 18 were all that progressed. Two more dropped out because we're used to giving chemotherapy and the parents got nervous and said, oh, I can't wait six weeks without doing anything. So they dropped out of the study after the first treatment and went on to another chemotherapy. But the most important thing, I think, for the, from the FDA standpoint is there, were no, there was no damage to the kidney, no damage to the bone marrow in any of these kids. And that's what we need uh, to be able to go on and study this drug a little more closely. Here's the six-year-old who was treated on this protocol. Uh, here's a, a lesion in the liver. Sorry, you can't see that very well. And it's size at the end of the treatment. Here's the important thing. The gastrin levels really, really responded nicely to this disease. We were, the surgeon was able to go in after this treatment and take out the main pancreatic lesion. We were able to, and this is one of the beauties in kids, uh, we were able to take out three quarters of her liver and she grew it back. And uh, she's now four and a half years out with uh, no disease and even off sandostatin. Okay, so to summarize, I want to give you uh, a pop quiz. So raise your hands. Do kids get nets? Okay, you're right. Appendix is the most common net in kids. No, all right. Neuroblastoma incidence is greater than 
for neuroendocrine tumors in people under age 30? Yes. Okay. And neuroblastoma prevalence is greater than NETS in people under 30. No. All right. So, you guys, you're great. Uh, I want to acknowledge my team at Iowa uh, we, who worked together with us uh, in doing this phase one study, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments for the uh, speakers from this morning? Dr. Grammer. Yes. Well, thank, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I just have one comment to the kids with the recurrent pneumonias. And you said there was a lesion on CT. I think that you, you should do a bronchoscopy because the patient might have a small intrabronchial tumor difficult to detect in other ways. That was the only comment. Uh, you know, that's a very good comment because um, the surgeons, in, we ended up having to go back and do uh, a bronchoscopy in this child. And um, unfortunately, they didn't get it all out the, the, the second time. But that's a very important way to follow as well. Would you agree? And we're, we're doing uh, bronchoscopy every year. And, and the peptides so far have been negative in this uh, child and follow up. Uh, but I think it's a very important point. Dr. Wolin. The, uh, the reason I recommend this is because uh, having looked at all this data from uh, uh, not just that, that lung carcinoid is the most common carcinoid in this age group, but it's the most common lesion, uh, lung carcinoid is the most common lung tumor in children. So if you see, uh, if I see a child who has neuroblastoma, uh, they don't get lung disease. If I see a child with a uh, Wilms tumor who has a lung lesion, I don't do an Octrea scan. They probably have uh, either an infection or a lung met, which would not be Octrea scan positive. But if I see a primary new tumor, new lesion in a child in this age group, and I would say that the cutoff uh, age group would be under the age of 20, then I, yes, I would recommend before they went in to get uh, to remove the, the tumor. I don't think you need to do it if you're just doing a biopsy, which is, I think uh, one of the reasons Dr. Granberg recommended the bronchial, uh, bronchial look first. Uh, but if you're going to take it out, so this was a large lesion, and the surgeon went in and actually tried to excise the whole thing. We got the Octree scan afterwards. And uh, that's what told them they didn't get the whole thing. Uh, but I do think, under the age of 20, if you see a primary lung lesion in a child who's had previous pneumonias that have been that have been negative for uh, culture, Octrea scan would be very appropriate. Thank you very much, Dr. Teresa, Dr. Diaz, and Dr. Granberg. Uh, at as you're all aware, we, uh, we do have a, a schedule that we're trying to keep. We are about 40 minutes uh, behind schedule, so I do apologize for not having all the, answer, uh, all the questions answered.